Hi, Russ of Aquarimax here. In today's installment of the Isopod Care Guide, we'll talk about how to troubleshoot isopod deaths. When you keep dozens, hundreds, or thousands of isopods, a few deaths, to be honest, are not unusual. Isopods don't live an extremely long time, so if you notice fairly small numbers of mature isopods dying, this could very well be due to natural causes. However, significant numbers of isopods that are dying are usually a signal that something is wrong and you may need to change something in their environment. The first thing I recommend checking is general husbandry. Take a good look at your enclosure, see what's going on. Desiccation is a common cause of death for isopods, so you need to make sure they're not drying out. Is there a somewhat damp but not soaked area in the enclosure so the isopods can always access that area and hydrate if needed? I like to provide mine with a mossy hydration station, but it can be done without moss if you prefer. The important thing is that they can go there to an area where it's damp. Similarly, can they access a drier area? There are a good number of species like Porcelio lavis, Atlantosha floridana, and Trichorhina tomentosa, just to name a few, that are not too insistent on a dry area, but others, such as many of the Mediterranean Porcelio, like Porcelio expansis or Porcelio flava marginatus, and some of the Armadillidium species, like uh, Armadillidium klugai, that can die if they don't have the chance to choose between moist and dry areas when needed. I find it best to provide a gradient for nearly all species that I keep. Ventilation is another crucial aspect of husbandry to examine. All isopods need oxygen to breathe, of course, but some species are much more sensitive to stagnant air than others and can gradually die off without sufficient ventilation. This is true of some, but not all, of the Armadillidium genus, again, as well as many of the Mediterranean Porcelio from countries such as Spain and Greece. For those species that are not particularly sensitive to low ventilation, a sterilite tub without any modification for ventilation provides sufficient airflow because the lid is not airtight. But for those that need more airflow, there are many different ways to provide this additional ventilation. One very effective way is to cut one to two inch holes in the lid and then cover them with fine mesh, such as chiffon fabric, usually with some supplemental holes along the sides for cross ventilation. I've been using that method for years with great success. And more recently, I've been using another common method as well. That's to drill many smaller holes along the upper sides of the enclosure and or along the edge of the lid. And this latter method has several advantages. It helps protect the enclosure against uh, drying out too fast. It provides plenty of cross ventilation and it allows for stacking the enclosures one on top of the other without compromising the ventilation at all, which is especially important when you're working with limited space. To help protect against entry by pests, the holes can be covered with fine mesh, like chiffon, again, or with breathable medical tape, and there are links in the description. Isopods with a proper substrate, including plentiful decaying leaves and wood, are really unlikely to starve to death even without supplemental foods, but improper foods can sometimes cause the death of isopods as well. Fruits or vegetables that have not been properly washed and preferably peeled might expose your isopods to lethal levels of pesticides. Overfeeding can lead to excessive mold growth, and the filamentous growth of mold can not only trap small isopods, especially juveniles, it can sometimes cause a dangerous buildup of carbon dioxide in a poorly ventilated enclosure. Before we talk about some more factors in isopod deaths, I want to give a shout out to my patrons at Patreon. I really appreciate everything you do for the channel. Just one of the ways I try to show my gratitude is that as a patron, you can post questions directly to me on Patreon, and I can answer those either directly in a Patreon message, or I can cover them in an upcoming live stream, your choice. If that sounds like something that you'd like to try, click the link at the end of this video. And now, let's talk about some factors beyond the enclosure that can cause isopod deaths. Sudden temperature fluctuations or temperature extremes are two of these. While some isopods can take wide temperature swings, like little champs, some of the more fragile species can even start to die off within acceptable temperature ranges if that change is sudden. Other changes in environment can cause die-off too. For instance, 
Not long after receiving my first Porcelio Ornatus High Yellow, I lost a few of them for no apparent reason other than the adjustment to a new environment, and that's not uncommon. Fortunately, as is very often the case, the remaining individuals soon begin to reproduce, and now I have many more than I started with. An often overlooked cause of isopod deaths are substances such as pesticides, cleaning sprays, and similar airborne chemicals. Isopods can be quite sensitive to these, as you might imagine. More than one isopod keeper has contacted me wondering about a sudden die-off, and after discussing a multitude of possibilities, we've narrowed down the most likely culprit to the use of an airborne chemical spray. I try to avoid the use of such things near my isopods at all. They are usually less toxic and less airborne alternatives. Though the reasons I have mentioned are likely some of the most common reasons for untimely isopod deaths, there are certainly others, and some, quite honestly, can be hard to pinpoint. One interesting, if unfortunate, fact about isopods is that out of a group born at exactly the same time in identical conditions, some individuals will often die quite young and others not long after maturity, and other individuals will go on to live much, much longer. And this tendency is more pronounced in some species than it is in others. Many of the common hobby isopod species tend to live between one and three years, but there is a lot of variation and some very salient exceptions. You can read more species-specific information about isopod lifespan in Oren McMonagle's book, Isopod Zoology. There's a link in the description. Hopefully, this video has helped you hone in on the factors you can control to prevent deaths among your isopods, as well as to recognize factors that are simply beyond your influence. So, don't beat yourself up about them. And on that note, I don't blame you a bit if you get a little attached to your isopods. I do too. Thanks for watching today. I post videos every Tuesday and Friday all on aquarium and vivarium pets with lots of isopod content. Please feel free to share, rate, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe and tap the bell so you don't miss my next video.